Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, Gathered here in one strong body, Gathered here in the struggle and the power, Spirit draw near. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, Gathered here in one strong body, Gathered here in the struggle and the power, Gathered here in the struggle and the power, Gathered here in one strong body, Gathered here in the struggle and the power, Spirit draw near. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, Gathered here in one strong body, Gathered here in the struggle and the power, Gathered here in one strong body, Gathered here in the struggle and the power, Spirit draws struggle and the power, Spirit draw near. Spirit draw near. Spirit draw near. Oh, aren't our Westwood musicians amazing? Here I am with my stewardship hat on again and happy to bring you our weekly update. Look at that. Green is up on the ladder reaching for that next rung, trying to get there and bring their friends up with them. So we've got three of them still hanging out at the bottom, all lonely. Green is going to hopefully get up onto that green rung by next week. And uh, then we have all the other ones who would like to get up there with them. Could we have the next slide, please? So for those of you who are having trouble figuring out how to help our friends get up on that stewardship ladder, you go to www.westwoodunitarian.ca, our website, as you all know, I think most of you know, and you see this big arrow here, there's a stewardship button on right at the top of the website, you click on that and it'll take you to the stewardship page where you can review all the information. And then we need you to do two or possibly three things, but two things for sure. We need to, you to choose either update existing pledge or new pledge and fill out those forms. It really doesn't take much time. Honest, I promise it doesn't take much time. And if you are updating an existing pledge and you are changing the amount, then you would need to fill out the other PAD form, which is just that form that the office would normally send you and you fill it out so that you can do your bank transfers if that's the way you do them. So if you make a change in a bank transfer amount, we need you to do that extra step. And it's right there, you can download it, you can take a picture of it or scan it and send it back to the office. Then the second thing that we would really like everyone to do is to click on the yellow time and talent button and fill out that form. So even if you're just continuing doing what you always do, we'd really appreciate you just doing a check-in and fill out that form so that we kind of know where people are at. That's it. Two forms, maybe three, if you're making a change. Thank you so much. And let's hope we can get all those people up on the ladder by next week, because we're coming to the end of March, folks. Thanks. And now let's sing along with Jennifer. i 
As we begin this morning, we pause to recognize and appreciate the Treaty 6 First Nations, predominantly Cree peoples, upon whose traditional land our Westwood building and many of us gathered here today are fortunate to be situated on. If you know the names of the traditional lands at your location, please share them in the chat. Good morning, happy spring to everyone, and welcome to Westwood Unitarian Congregation. We are one of many Unitarian Universalist congregations around the world. It is our intention at Westwood to build a culture of gentleness with one another, where we value and practice inclusivity, and where we support people in solving problems and addressing concerns. We take collective responsibility for practical tasks, community building, and long-term sustainability of our congregation. My name is Lisa Stein and I'm your service leader this morning. Our speaker is Liz James from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and our musicians are Jennifer McMillan and Rebecca Patterson. We are grateful to be meeting together virtually at this time in our lives, although many of us yearn to see each other once again in real life. Our ongoing commitment to share the same space and time each Sunday morning remains sacred. I would also like to welcome those of you who are here for the first time or who consider yourselves new to our congregation. Each month we embrace a new overarching theme that knits our services together. And this month the theme is cooperation. It takes many hands to bring Sunday services to Zoom each week and to reimagine our annual events and connections completely online. As we've traveled through this past year, Westwood has continued to exemplify the spirit of cooperation, allowing us to grow, rest, and serve the world as each of us individually desires. And for this, we are grateful. And now Liz will light the chalice for us this morning. Good morning. I'd like to light the chalice with these words. No amount of fuel can make a flame without heat and air. No amount of heat can make a flame without air and fuel. And every time we light our chalice, we pay homage to this truth, that it is our interconnections that bring us to life. And if you have a chalice this morning to light, you may light it now. As March is our stewardship month, we ask a member of our congregation to provide a stewardship moment about what Westwood means to them. And this morning, I'm happy to introduce Rebecca Patterson for our stewardship moment. Hi, and uh, uh, thank you for asking me. I was really honored to speak today. Um, just this morning, I realized that it's probably the anniversary of our first uh, visit to Westwood today, 19 years ago in, um, I guess that was 2002. And uh, our youngest was uh, almost two and now he's 20, almost 21. So um, yeah, I've been with Westwood for a long, long time. Um, at the time we were having some trouble with the church community we were part of. I've been, always been a churchy person. I've always, uh, even when my family wasn't um, interested in gathering, speaking of gathering here, gathered here, um, I was always one to tootle myself off as a 12 year old or whatever to church on Sunday morning. And uh, so I've always enjoyed these gatherings, but um, we were having some trouble, especially I was having some trouble with the church community I was starting to become aware of myths that were presented as truths and um, that had been borrowed by the church and uh, appropriation of pagan festivals and so on that um, didn't feel honest to me. And um, my husband, Ivan, had done a little shopping with the help of his sister, Audrey, who's also a friend of her congregation. And um, he ended up inviting me to come with him to his second visit to Westwood. And that first gathering just blew me away. Um, first of all, there was the welcome where everyone was, was invited specifically by in ways that I had not heard in a church before. Um, and, uh, and then 
not only that, but two people, uh, Mitch and Elaine were the two speakers that day. Elaine did the uh, story for all ages. And she explained that behind uh, the wall, now the, our new bathroom's there, but um, behind that wall was a bathtub and that the church that had been in there before believed that you had to have this bath to make you good and clean. And she said, we boarded up that bathtub because we think we're already good and clean. And um, the idea of original sin that around Lent especially was so important. Um, I realized I didn't believe in that. And then um, Mitch did, uh, he was the lay leader at the time and he did a child dedication. And this beautiful dedication, all our children had been baptized, which I, I thought was a beautiful thing as well. But he, he sprinkled water with a rose and blessed the child's head, intellect and words and hands and feet uh, for all the, the good that this child was going to do in the world. And um, I had just found, it was home, I was home. So since then, I've been at gatherings large and small, um, including Harmonia, spinning the web dinners. Um, I was invited to lead sometimes, to be part of all these uh, different kinds of gatherings. I found my voice in many ways. I um, have been given leadership opportunities that uh, I've really valued. And um, I've also been offered the opportunity to rest. It, I find that Westwood offers so much depending on what a person's needs are. And uh, I'm proud and very content to be part of gathering here for 19 years. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. At this time, we pause to reflect on our week and meditate on the milestones, joys, concerns, and sorrows in each of our lives. Community is deepened by sharing with each other what is in our hearts. We invite you now to type your joys and concerns into the chat as the song plays.
we also recognize and cherish the joys and concerns that remain in our hearts. While remaining muted, please join in reciting the affirmation. May the light, May the light of these candles, candles inspire us to use our powers, powers to, to heal, heal and not, and to, not harm, to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. Hey everybody, it's Alara Stephanie Cadet, and my pronouns are they and them. Today I am here to talk to you with my tech hat on, and I'm also here as a worship committee member because we thought that it would be great to offer you some bonus stewardship material. So today, what I'm here to talk to you about is one really simple and quick way to help us reach a broader audience and build our community out in the world and that is through engaging on our social media platforms. So Westwood Unitarian currently has three social media platforms. We have a Facebook platform, we have a Twitter, and we have a YouTube channel. And all three of those have very regular content being posted through wonderful committee members and staff as a way to reach the broader world. But one thing about how social media works is in its name. It's actually social media. So one of the best ways to help us reach a broader audience is by, as members of the congregati congregation, engaging with the posts that we put out. So that can be anything from clicking the like button on the YouTube or the Facebook or the Twitter, any of those three, very quick thing. But doing that actually really broadens the scope and the reach of those posts. And then there are two other ways to engage with those posts that are going out and that is by commenting which is one of the best ways because it shows people who are not within our core community that we are an active community that cares about the content that we're putting out into the world and then the last way which is also a fabulous way of contributing is by sharing the posts that we put onto all of our media outlets so those are three ways that you can contribute that sound simple and maybe they don't sound simple, and if they don't sound simple, you are more than welcome to get a hold of me. I am happy to offer help to anybody who wants to learn how to do those things. But they make a really big difference in our reach as a congregation out in the world. So that is my tech tip for Stewardship Month. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. And I'd also like to remind everyone that our congregation is entirely self-governed and financially supported by the voluntary generosity of our members and friends. Donations to Westwood are always accepted and appreciated at any time by following the instructions found here on this slide. And you can also find these on our webpage and also through the information provided for our March stewardship campaign. We take this moment to celebrate the programs, events and activities that we lovingly support. While remaining on mute, please join in singing the offertory affirmation. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live, together I receive. I'd like to introduce this morning's speaker, Liz James, who hails from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Liz is well known at Westwood as a speaker and friend and also as the popular UU humorist and curator of the UU Hysterical Society Facebook page. Liz is also the co-creator of the Craft Cup podcast. Liz's topic this morning is gathered where? Welcome, Liz. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Westwood is one of my favorite places to come talk at, and I see so many familiar faces, and that makes it very exciting for me. So thank you for inviting me. I'm going to begin with a reading this morning. It's from the Facebook page of a man named David Richards, January 2021. He wrote this. For anyone who isn't on TikTok, I want to share a story. One week ago, 
A TikTok user with Parkinson's posted a video expressing anger over how tiny the pills for treating Parkinson's are because it makes them very difficult to pick up when someone has something like, you know, Parkinson's. Four days ago, a guy who directs country music videos for a living and who was previously most famous on TikTok for knowing obscure facts about Snapple, taught himself how to use Fusion 360, a design and modeling tool, so he could design a pill bottle that solves the problem. Problem was though, he didn't own a 3D printer, so he posted a video of his design, offered to share schematics with anyone who wanted to test or improve it. All schematics are open source. Three days ago, dozens of engineers and 3D printer enthusiasts had begun working on the project and started refining and tweaking it to get tolerances where they needed to be, ensuring it actually met, met the needs of those it was being designed for. 13 hours ago, there is a working prototype which has less plastic than your average McDonald's toy and should be priced as such, the original designer has gotten a patent attorney to ensure that it remains open source and the patent itself will be donated to the Michael J. Fox Foundation. In the meantime, for anyone who needs one now and doesn't want to wait until manufacturing at scale begins, they can get one at cost from engineers printing them at home. End of the story. I want you to cast your mind back a single generation and imagine that same problem 30 years ago. When I was a child, Someone who was unhappy with a pill dispenser would have needed to call the company. Enough consumer complaints would result in feedback to the engineers. Maybe a team would have been struck to look at it. Because of the high cost of manufacturing, there would need to be multiple prototypes because you wouldn't want to get it wrong. And eventually, a few years later, there'd be a new pill dispenser. When I was a child, all of our options were more fixed. You chose what you could from the stuff available at the store. You got your news from the newspaper or the TV, same news as your neighbor got. You chose your music from the artists that the record label selected for you. If you wanted community and spirituality, you went to church and you prayed to Jesus. And if you weren't keen on the Jesus part being quite so mandatory or you were a strange duck in some other way, you went to the Unitarians. I want to tell you another story from 15 years ago. My stepson and his girlfriend were showing me a stack of pictures from a recent event that her family had held. They kept rifling through the printed images, muttering, no, that's not the right one. No, that's blurry. There's a weird leaf in the way on this one. Finally, my stepson said in exasperation, why did her mother print off all of these terrible photos? I asked if she was using a film camera. And to David's credit, he knew what a film camera was. And he said no. And then I paused for a second and said, maybe she took the pictures and printed them all because she was using a digital camera as though it were a film camera. She'd learned the physical technology, but not the accompanying habits. How fast the world is shifting. I recently heard my 17 year old start a sentence to his younger brother with, in my day, and I have to tell you, in my day, you had to be older than 17 to start sentences with, in my day. Not only are things changing, the way in which things are changing is changing. How we take pictures, that hasn't just changed. When we take pictures has changed. What we do with the pictures has changed. How we remember where we left our car in the parking lot, that's changed. Police accountability has changed. These things haven't just changed for the people who own digital cameras, they've changed for everyone. 3D printers have changed the capability of people to create custom niche solutions. And that just doesn't change the world of the people with the 3D printers, it changes the world of the people with Parkinson's, the people in manufacturing. Social media, has changed the world of the people on social media, but also the people who are affected by the elections that are fought out there. Each shift brings new habits and structures and faster and faster, we have to figure things out and figure out them quickly and over and over again. There are all these cultural shifts. So what do we do with that? How do we gather now? Well, one of the biggest shifts in the culture has been in the structure. I remember life in what I'll call an institutional world where there was a pill company and they chose which pill dispenser design and we lived with it to a viral one where there can be a bunch of pill dispenser designs and the good idea just takes off. In the institutional world, there's Encyclopedia Britannica. In the viral one, there's Wikipedia. In the institutional world, you rent a video that was produced because a film studio chose that video out of a pile of scripts. In a viral world, everyone can make a video and you can watch the one that's kind of a niche interest to you or the one that takes off. Is this a good thing? I think that's a pointless question. Nobody's asking our permission, so it doesn't matter if we think it's a good thing. How do we navigate that? That's a useful question. The bigger question I've been thinking about for Unitarianism is, which of the two worlds are we from? 
setting aside for a minute, it's not actually a dichotomy. It's not even really a spectrum. I've way oversimplified things to make them easier to talk about. Setting that aside, how much of an institutional thing are we and how much of a viral thing are we? Are we Encyclopedia Britannica or are we Wikipedia? You'd think we'd be institutional, maybe. Religion and institutions do go hand in hand. Ours is no exception. We have all kinds of structures. On the other hand, we're not a typical religion. We don't hand things down from on high. We're intentionally democratic. Nobody chooses for us what we believe or how we will express that belief. Many of the values of a viral world are our values. So I think we think sit somewhere in the middle, but I also think we get to choose where we want to sit in all this. As someone pointed out in the incredible social enterprise workshop held at Westwood Congregation two years ago, people are pouring out of churches across the continent, but those people don't cease to exist. When people pour out of one place, they pour into another, and we get to choose where we position ourselves relative to all that people pouring. Nobody gets to tell us where we should stand. So how do we pick where to stand? What's the plan? Both as a religion, but also as individual people who need to figure out how to plan their days. Well, I think it starts with a shift in thinking. We need to talk about cultural shifts inherent in shifting from an institutional-based society to more of a viral one. So this morning, I wanna explore with you the idea of shifting how we imagine ourselves. Moving from imagining ourselves as an institution, an organized, structured, planned creature to a different way of thinking. I want to try on imagining ourselves as nestled in this new viral change, interrelated, schmozzly, Wild West kind of world. What do we call that kind of world? A collection of alive things without formal organization imposed on them? Well, we call that an ecosystem. Today, I want to talk to you about viewing ourselves at, through the lens of ecosystem thinking. What changes when we view ourselves that way? Now, first, I need to specify we aren't one ecosystem as a society. All ecosystems are collections of tiny ecosystems and UUism and it's, has its own little biome of strange ducks. That's what's always been magical, the sense of finding your people and that hasn't changed at all. One of the best things about the ecosystem way of doing things, it makes room for stories and people that are not mainstream and we are not mainstream. To illustrate this, Alara is gonna share a video now that illustrates this point far better than I ever could. Alara? she arrived they um she was given a room to stay while her new leg was being made she was fitted with the leg in her favorite color pink and started walking on it right away after a few weeks of training to walk and run in her new prosthetic she is ready to go home and live her life without limitations with you <laughs> oh okay what do you say to the people tell thank them, you tell them thank you thank you for making it I love that video so much because it talks to the power of seeing yourself reflected in the stories around you. And it's not a good one to do in the middle of a sermon though. I remember my years of running the newcomer program in Saskatoon so fondly because over and over again, people get this expression on their faces. You probably know it. It's that expression of 
thank you for making a church that looks like me. It's so powerful to be seen and have your story told. One of the wonders of the ecosystem society is for people who are a little bit different from the mainstream, whether that be belief or something about your identity or abilities, we're all different in one way or another. It's so much easier to find spaces that look like you. Institutional society had to be broad. Five o'clock news needed to be one big main conversation. Movies needed to have broad appeal to be economically feasible. But in an ecosystem way of thinking, we can have these tiny microbiomes. UUism is one, but we can also have these tiny pockets within UUism. We can have groups for people who want to express their Unitarianism through long distance hiking or groups that want to discuss the good place from Netflix as their sacred text. The people who want to run the humor group and the people who run the social justice group need to relate in a way that's symbiotic. But specialization is a good thing. In an institutional mindset, it can be a problem. We need shared consensus, shared best practices. We need to put a lot of work into making space for everyone, which can be labor intensive. A person who isn't having their needs met can require a lot of modification and resources from the group. In a viral world, that's sometimes what you wanna do, but not always. Sometimes the solution isn't to compromise the purpose of your tiny group, but to have people reshuffle and find the group that meets their need. There's this tremendous potential because a given community doesn't have to be everything to everyone. We don't have to agree on the one type of doll we're gonna make. You can find the doll that looks just like you. And this is a wonderful thing. And it's wonderful that we do this because the more homogeneous we are, the more vulnerable we are. Let me explain what I mean. Remember the ecosystem you were taught in school, the food chain, the grass grows in the the grass grows in the dirt and the bunny eats the grass and the fox eats the bunny and then the dirt eats the fox. No follow-up questions about that, please. And then there is this great circle of life. It turns out that type of ecosystem is a very fragile one. One big wave of creeping bellflower and all of a sudden the grass is gone and now the foxes have no bunnies to eat and the whole thing collapses. A healthy ecosystem is actually quite a mess. The bunnies eat a zillion different things and they get eaten by a zillion different things. And so long as there's a lot going on, it's much harder for one thing to sweep through and wipe things out. In the world of UUism, the idea of religion as being contained by one structure, such as churches, makes us vulnerable. That's a tidy food change with a few types of creatures in it. What we need is a mess of a zillion different ways of practicing Unitarianism that are all interconnected with each other and feed each other. And there's the solstice stuff and the social enterprise stuff and the online things. And the schmazel means that good things can spread and weeds can be drowned out and we can have enough diversity going on that we can change shape as we need to. Practices like rigid credentialing structures or the consolidation of power in certain institutions, those things work against us in terms of developing the diversity that we need to thrive and stay healthy. We need different things legitimizing each other and supporting each other so that the person who hates the Unitarian Universalist hiking our way to enlightenment group is able to find the way to their Netflix, Netflix discussion group and vice versa. So from the ecosystem think, way of thinking, lesson one is a doll who looks like me. Microbiomes are a good thing and the days of one size fits all are gone. Lesson two, a diverse ecosystem is a strong ecosystem. We want lots of different things happening, but with strong connections between them. The third thing I wanna talk about is a lesson that was branded into me as a small child at my grandparents' house. When I would go to toss a banana peel into the garbage because it was, you know, garbage. In school, putting garbage in the garbage can was a good thing, but at my grandparents' house, it would cause a horrified yelp as one or the other of them would leap out of their chair and yell, compost. In a gardener's world, value is ascribed differently. Potato peelings and crusts of bread are gold. They're second only to manure, which my grandparents very kindly didn't get into a lot of detail about. In my personal life, I am too quick to think of things as garbage when they are actually compost. I'm too quick to think that the end is the end when often the ending of one thing is a launch pad for something else. This is especially true of those times when things are a poor fit. In the world I grew up in, you wanted to do a good job fitting into school and the institutions and the roles ascribed to you. But in today's world, it is often our misshapen places, our ways we don't fit, our weird passions for certain hobbies, our obsessions with solving certain types of problems instead of doing our homework. It's often those things that are our greatest strength. 
because there's so many options for what kinds of context you can live your life in now. So the skill of choosing your context becomes almost a more important skill than fixing your flaws, depending on the situation. Sometimes you aren't a poorly shaped failed who's a what's it, you're a perfectly shaped something else. Sometimes you think you're cracking when you're in fact hatching. Sometimes we're trying like crazy to hold on to the things from the past when we don't need to. We see the potato as just a potato and as it ages and grows weird tentacles, we see that as a failed and stinky potato. Lesson three, when things are no longer doing a great, big, a great job of what they used to be, they aren't garbage. They need to find the right context. Those things are compost or sometimes seeds. If they're potatoes, they can be a whole bunch of things. This brings me to my last story. I learned this last summer, just as lockdown started, we bought a house and I spent the summer alternating between helping build an online community in my work stuff and trying to convince a big patch of lawn that it ought to be a garden in my home stuff. I assumed this would be pretty easy. I mean, there's this huge lawn care section in Home Depot with fertilizers and sprinklers and trimmers and all of that gives you the impression that a blade of grass is a delicate thing that will fade away at the slightest challenge. I don't know if I have special blades of grass in my backyard, but this was not the case for me. They had a lot of fight in them and there was a lot more of them than there was of me. At this point, my friend John, who grew up on a farm, told me to plant potatoes. I initially pushed back because I was too exhausted to plant anything and he convinced me to take a break from ripping and digging and do some planting and then leave things well enough alone. At first, it looked like this had been a bad idea. The grass was still ominously creeping in and the potato seedlings were very small. But by fall, those potatoes had taken over. They towered over the grass. They didn't kill all of it, but they definitely dominated the terrain. And John told me if I keep doing this, the potatoes will win. I began to apply this lesson to the online communities I was building when I wasn't gardening. When a comment would appear that needed weeding, my instinct was to address it, to pour energy into fixing it, to draw the attention of the Facebook algorithms to it in the way Alara described by lines of lines and lines of comments. It turns out that the vast majority of the time, pouring your energy into planting and fertilizing and watering good things, maybe laying a little ground cover, pulling the occasional weed, is better than hunting down all the weeds. It's the thriving garden that matters, after all. And if it's doing well, a strong ecosystem can take care of some weeds on its own. Weeding is not as good a use of time as one would think. And yet, as a UU and as a liberal generally, I find myself always drawn to finding the bad thing and denouncing it or arguing with it or focusing on it. Sometimes this is what you need to do, but often it's life energy that could be better spent in other ways. Particularly if the garden I'm metaphorically weeding isn't even my own garden and I'm actually weeding my neighbor's garden, which sometimes happens because I like to give my two cents on everything. Okay, I've highlighted three aspects of ecosystem thinking. One, a doll who looks like me, know what your niche is and own it. Two, a diverse ecosystem. Let's have a whole variety of things going on. Keep the connections between the things strong so good things can spread. Three, know the difference between garbage and compost as a group and in our personal lives. Treat things that aren't working like launching grounds for things that will work or things that won't work but will be launching grounds for the next thing that will work. And four, put more energy into planting and fertilizing and designing than weeding. Most of your energy should go into building strength. All of this is a lot easier said than done, which brings me to my final point, which is actually the first task of gardening. When I first got started, I had a friend who was an expert in permaculture and I asked him what the core of the permaculture perspective was. And he said, you sit in a hammock a lot. He was referring to the first principle of permaculture, which is observe and interact. Permaculture isn't as much about hard grunt work as it is about wise work and paying attention. And this is really true of modern life. It used to be that we needed legions of people to put their heads down and follow and do unskilled work. And that's less true every decade in all kinds of industries. More and more, the task in front of us is about judgment, choosing how to spend your time, choosing who to connect with, what to put your energy into, choosing your context so that it makes your weaknesses irrelevant and your strengths crucial. We need to be wise as much as we need to be hardworking. And the other task is about connection. Whether you are an online person creating follows, followers or a church building a reputation or an individual nurturing relationships with your neighbors, 
your ability to draw people to you with joy and empathy is crucial. Being wise and drawing people to you, those two tasks. You can do neither of those things when you're tired. And so exhausting ourselves in the name of whatever we serve makes no sense anymore. Rest matters more than ever. Even when the task is very important, especially then, exhausting ourselves in the name of a cause is like watering a garden with a watering can filled with holes. You need to have good tools and you are the tools, except that you're not a tool, you're a person. And for this reason, more than anything, we need to give ourselves permission to be militant about joy and rest. So we'll be wise enough to plant potatoes instead of becoming obsessed with whatever weed is stuck under our skin. <clears throat> so we'll be self-aware enough to know what kind of community we are and who we serve and who we don't. So we'll be well-connected enough so that we can gather and good things will spread to us and from us. And we will embody this energy that will draw people to us, to gather with us and build the momentum and joy. In a world that changes constantly, we've got to travel by compass, not by map. We don't have the luxury of surveying the terrain and plotting the perfect course. The roads keep shifting. So we have to be good at readjusting, at checking our internal compass. And the internal compass doesn't work without joy and rest. So if you take one thing away from the whole idea of ecosystems, I hope it's this, that we must be gentle with ourselves. We must leave space and time for things to grow. We must take care of ourselves and of each other. And now let's sing. Soon the day will arrive when we will be together and no longer will we live in fear. And the children will smile without wondering whether on that day thunder clouds will appear wait and see wait and see what a world there can be if we share if we care you and me wait and see I'm going to read a poem to extinguish our chalice. It's a bit of a longer poem than a chalice extinguishing normally is, so I invite you to get comfortable. You are not on call for the pain of the world. I know you feel every hit of the hammer, beating plowshares into swords and people into plowshares, and every time you fail to step between the blow and its target, the injustice is sewn into your bones too. And so when the hammer rises with it, when the hammer rises, you must rise with it, raising your voice, your eyes, your awareness, your body, whatever part of you can be given as an offering. But you can't stay this way forever. Sewn to this cacophony of blows, every movement of yours a follow until your body is owned by the drumbeat of the raising of weapons until your days string together in a stuttering heartbreak of rage and you can't catch your breath. But this is what you promised. To those who don't get to choose whether or not to show up for the fight, for those whose very bodies thrust them into the ring, you promised that you would hold nothing back. I know. Except you can't be on call for the pain of the world. It's not work that can be done without sleep. 
When we said people are too sacred to be beaten into plowshares or swords, we meant you. We need you for the fight and for all of the things that are less and more than fighting. We need you to be ready to listen in the soft way that earth listens to the rain in the hours before dawn, to be tender, to cradle precious things, to hold the smell of dew in your hair, to hum a song that flowers will rise up through the earth to hear. I need you to stay in love with the world. Thank you for all of your wonderful words, Liz. That was just brilliant. And thank you everybody for joining us this morning. Next week, I want to remind you that we're welcoming our guest speaker, Michael Gadette, with his talk, Best Kept Secrets of Kidney Health. 